that's a funny shirt. I thought I'd put it up on the thing. All right, so uh, we we uh, wanted to put together a, a quick talk on how to talk to the parent and how the parents can talk to the kids about this and and sort of the situation that's handling that's ha um, happening out there and how do we handle it uh, as parents. Um, like I talked about last week, there's a, a group of us that are sort of a, a little mini task force that, and we're actually meeting with Sayna tomorrow here at St. Paul's um, to kind of discuss the, how to discuss this topic um, because it's a really big topic, it's a really important topic, um, and it's concerning a lot of people and what's happening whenever something kind of evolves that's new is the normal thing that happens are extreme reactions, right? Um, you see this with COVID, right? Anything new that disrupts the system, everyone just, you know, people go to the, the ends. Um, and so what we want to do is figure out where's the middle and, and try to how to think about this as, as Christians um, in a loving way. So um, time is short, the needs are great. Uh, there's a lot of things happening. Um, we have to embrace strategies that'll help our young people have hope in God. Um, I, I can tell you that, you know, in talking with a lot of youth, this issue just comes up a lot. A lot more than it exists in the, as a percentage of the population, but it comes up a lot with the youth. Um, many young people abandon their faith while they're still at home with their parents. Um, that's when they decide that they're going to leave the church, and they usually decide when I get older, I'm going to leave the church. So it isn't in college that this becomes a problem. Um, and, you know, like, oh, they left when they went to college. Actually, they left in the ninth grade, right? And they were just kind of biding their time. Um, young people leave the church are still interested in spiritual things. They're not lost causes. Uh, and they're still, and they're willing to listen if we listen. And this is one of the both cultural and generational gaps that we have right? Parenting is, is an authoritarian activity. It's top down. We all have Egyptian parents. We know how that goes, right? It's, it's very, you know, heavy handed. Um, and that's just not the right approach for today's um, young people in the world that we live in. We have to listen as much as we speak, uh, if not more. And that's, that's the way to engage uh, people. And we do need to address this issue I see when Andrew's smiling in the back. I just want to hear the jokes. Um, to uh, address this issue uh, before the school does, right? And it's not that we want to beat them to the punch. Um, uh, you know, it's not a race, but it's, it is about this is something that is being addressed in the schools. And when the church has no guidance and has no words, then I, I guess what the school said is fine, right? I mean, you know, they taught you about algebra and the church didn't say anything about algebra. So I guess algebra is, you know, so we have to be there. We have to be a part of this discussion, not just so that we're relevant, but that we're relevant to the kids' lives because otherwise they feel like we're outdated, we're not relevant. Um, and the church really has, you know, nothing to say other than, you know, let's talk about the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. Right, and, and we have to focus on, on maybe some things that are happening now. Not that there's anything wrong with the Council of Nicaea, 325 AD. All right, have all the kids gone good? So this is, this is coming at us from everywhere. Okay, this, this issue, right, this is the media. This is the cover of Time Magazine. Uh, LGBTQ representation in children's TV is growing, right? So you, you, you turn on cartoons. I was, I was, the other day I was watching a State Farm commercial and every other Every, every couple was gay in the State Farm commercial, right? And it's like, there's not that many, you know, but every, everyone was, and there's three of them. Um, we see this corporations, this is Walmart. This is during Gay Pride Month, right? The book, the, the, the book section is full. Uh, a parent snapped this to, and sent it to me angrily. Look at this, this is Walmart. This is every book they sell at Walmart. Groupon, you know, was giving you loud and proud and and was giving discounts to companies that had, you know, gay ties. In the schools, these are the books that our kids are told to read. These are the book reports that they write on. LGBTQ for, for, for kids, picture books, daddy, papa, and me, mama, uh, mommy, mama, and me. Um, and so this is coming at us and coming at the kids. 
uh, and then even the government. Uh, Washington State seeks a bill to remove parents from children's health care decisions. This actually went through. So if you're 13 or over, you are booted, you're, as a parent, you're booted out of your kid's medical portal until they reauthorize you to come in, so such that they have this, they, the kids have their own control over their own medical whatever, and, um, and the parents have to ask permission from the children to be allowed to, to, to have some of these things. And then I, I, this, one, this one just came out uh, August 12th. Scotland will let pupils change gender aged four without their parents' consent and tell teachers not to question a child's request to choose a new, ta new name or use a different toilet. Scottish government says school children age four can change gender. Young people wishing to switch gender must be supported and listened to. The newly implemented guidance has been described as shocking. Schools have been told to have trans transgender books on their curriculum. So, um, and this, this just came out, and of course this is making the rounds on, on social media. So you, you can see a, as a parent, um, you know, if, if someone, uh, I wanted to change my four-year-old's gender, and you know they said, you know, I'm sorry, this is a federal matter now. You, you can't get involved. I think I'd have some words, uh, and I would get involved. And it's a very scary world to be in as a parent. Um, well, I took a lot of time making those dots, so I'm going to show them to you. Um, and and so what we, it's not that easy. Okay. <laughs> No, you got to find the, anyway. So um, there's, okay, Peter Yusuf's laughing at me because he makes like very fancy PowerPoints and his like move and do things, whatever. All right, you better than me? So there's, there's very little doubt that there is like, there's a gay agenda out there, right? In fact, you know, this, there's books, uh, this is on Amazon, you know, the, the homosexual agenda, they're targeting America's children. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's hard to imagine that there isn't, right? There is definitely... Uh, a very precise target, um, especially at the kid level, right? And, and then we see it, and we see it quite a bit. Um, and it's working, right? So these are percentages from 1996, and the light green one is um, should be valid. You know, should you know, um, gay couples be allowed to marry? Now, obviously, this one is is got some politics in it, and so I don't want to get into that. But you can see that the general sentiment of the society we live in is very different than it was 20 years ago. Uh, it's changing very quickly, and so you know, all of this stuff m makes it very alarming to be a parent because you feel you feel scared, you feel threatened, um, you feel a lot of things, right? Um, fearful, resentful angry, confused, powerless, which is a very hard feeling when you're a parent to be powerless. Um, and this is also very different from our childhood, right? The way we grew up, even, you know, forget the, the people who grew up in Egypt, <laughs> um, the, us who grew up in America. Um, we live in fear of offending people. Uh, those of us who work with, any, with anybody, you're constantly on watch, right? If someone comes out to you or something, you know, and they're, they're a subordinate, you're scared, right? You don't know what's going to happen. Um, we live in fear of very heated arguments, uh, especially at family gatherings where these things blow up badly. Um, and we live in fear of getting sued or fired um, because of, 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 of a discrimination claim or saying a joke or, or saying something that you've said a thousand times and all of a sudden now it's like, oh, well, we're gonna have to talk to HR about this. Um, so all of this stuff is, is, is affecting us and our ability to parent, right? Because it's adding another load, right? The kids already, you know, sap the life out of us, okay? And now you have this, right? This other thing to contend with, okay? Um, so why are we talking about this? I mean, the, the church can do what the church can do, but parents are the front line. They're it. You're, you're, the, you're the image and likeness of God to your children, and, the, and, 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 and completely they, they learn about who God is from you, right? And so you can say Abuna, you can say Sunday school, you can say whatever, but you know what? You're it. Um, and it's, uh, um, it's, it's not just about speaking the truth. So when I say you're it, I'm not saying you're it like you have to teach them everything, which you, you kind of do. But you're it also the primary source of driving people away, your kids, from the faith, okay? The primary reason 
people leave the faith, they will tell you is my parents, right? And so what I'm more interested in today and to much of your chagrin is not what to say, but what not to say and how not to be. Um, I just hear it too much, right? Too many youth are just done with the church because of something Abuna said, something a parent said, something a Sunday school teacher said, um, an uncle or a tante, someone, whatever, right? That gets associated with the church, it gets associated with God. And then the, the thing is, what kind of loving God would say or think a thing like that? And that's a really good question, right? So um, when they hear these things and they hear hatred, right, and venom coming out of our mouths or out of people we know's mouths or out of the clergy's mouths or out of the Sunday school teacher's mouths, they have to associate and say, I I'm not interested in that God, right? And at some level, when kids leave the church because they have heard hate come out of the church, then uh, shouldn't we be happy about that, right? Shouldn't we be excited that the kids left the church? I mean, if they leave the church because they heard hatred, that's a good reason, right? What I would really be worried about is if they left the church, if they stayed in the church, right? If they hear a bunch of hatred coming out of someone's mouth and think, yeah, I love this church. I love this religion. They're racists, they're bigots, they're homophobes. These are my people, right? These are the kind of kids I would worry about. But when the kids leave because they've heard venom come out of them, I mean, then there's some good in them. Right? So as parents, we have this role. I mentioned this at the servant meeting last week. The parent uh, who came to me and said, my, my, my son's going to leave the church because of you know, our position on this issue. And you know, my reaction was, it's probably your position on this issue that's making that child leave. Right? It's probably the things you've said over and over and over again that are making that child leave and not necessarily the position of the church. Just leave her, Sam. It's okay. I mean, she's totally ruining the whole talk, but whatever, you know. So um, we have this, uh, we have this, uh, <laughs> she's so cute. Um, we have this, you know, immoral agenda, okay, of, of, and we talked a little bit about this last time, of, of taking, you know, wh what's the truth, the way Christ has asked us to live, and the way God has created man, and to, to shove it down, if you will, our throats in this country, and it's creating a reaction out of us. And so I want to talk about that a little bit. So the question is, who's behind this? Who's behind all of the pressure in the media, in the cartoons, in the government, in the books, in the school district, in the curriculum committees? Who's behind this pressure to, 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 to blur this line, right, and accept something that shouldn't maybe shouldn't be accepted? And so the answer is, is it isn't man. And we, we talked a little bit about this last week, but ultimately, Satan is behind this attack on our spiritual lives, on us. And uh, I talked about this a little bit last time too, but imagine if your friend is being attacked by robbers, right? And he's left bloody on the ground, okay? And the question is, what do you say and what do you do? to your friend who is left bloody on the ground? Um, do we curse the person who's on the ground? Do we curse the person who's been beat up? Do we point out their wounds to them? Uh, and the answer is no, right? Because we know that the person who did this to our friend, uh, our friend who is the image and likeness of God, is Satan. And so we have to realize that our battle is not with people. Our battle is not with human beings. Our battle is not with the teacher at the school or the administrator or the principal or the president of the PTA, right? The, the verse that St. Paul, you know, what St. Paul says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So when we see another human being, whatever their state, our, our, our battle isn't with them. Our beef isn't with them, right? Our beef is with the, 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 the spiritual realm that's manipulating them. And this is a very important distinction that we have to make as people. So we have to remember the gay person in front of you is not the enemy. He is not the agenda. He is a human being and the son of God. 
the image of God. And we can never forget that, regardless of whatever disfigurement they have or whatever issues they may have, we all have issues. We all have disfigurement. Okay? And when we get this concept, it helps set the tone for the kids. Because like I said, the kids are going to feel you. They're going to feel your emotions. They're going to feel your hatred, your resentment, your agenda. Okay? And they don't really care what you say. They're just going to know it. Right? You know, Bunadud Leme has this quote. I'll say it in Arabic, but I'll, I'll translate. He says, right? which means upbringing of kids is, is absorbed. Right? It, it's not what you say. They just absorb it from you. All right. And so this, this quote that you know, I've, I've said many times now, right? never confuse the person formed in the image of God with the evil that is in him. Right? Those are two different things. And so we can look and we can see the person and the agenda and the school teacher and the blah, 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 and the guy in the media and the person on MSNBC and the person ranting on, on YouTube. Right? But that's not the enemy. Uh, I, I love this quote also. Each person is the very icon of Christ incarnate in this world. Every person. And by the way, this is very orthodox. You know, when Abuna walks around and he senses the icons, he's also sensing what? You. Us. Why? Because we are the icons of Christ. So he's sensing these icons and the icons in the middle. Right? Both are the icons of Christ. Okay, so... Has Satan ever used people to attack the church? Sure, right? All the time. People have attacked the church from the very beginning. That's them stoning Stephen. And in fact, one of the guys is Paul, Saul at the time, right? And up till recent days, we have people, Satan using people to attack the church. Who's the enemy? Satan. Who's he using? People. And from the very beginning, Satan has used people to attack the church, right? So the, the people that crucified Christ, the Jews, the whatever, they were all riled up by the same guy, same enemy from the very beginning. And what I want to talk about is, is how do we, as Coptic Christians, handle this kind of attack, okay? Uh, you know, the, the story of St. Pachomius, he's a, he's a, we mentioned him in the commemoration. He's not a very well-known saint, but there's a story about him that just blows my mind. You know, do you guys know how he became a Christian? He was, he was a soldier, and he was, he, he's meant to go kill Christians. That was like, they just walked around and killed. And they were, they were going to a town, and their orders were, this is a Christian village, execute everyone in the village. Right? So these villagers found out about this execution, Right? And in the spirit of amazing love decided, you know what, these soldiers are going to be walking for three days. Let's make them some food. They're probably hungry and they could use a home-cooked meal before they slaughter us. And they did. And they offered them love, the soldiers. And the soldiers said, do you guys know why we're here? And they're like, yeah, we know. But this is our God and this is what we do. We, we repay good for evil. This is how we roll. And St. Pachomius at that moment was so moved that he said to himself, if I ever survive this war, I'm going to be a Christian. So how did he become a Christian? An example. He saw it. He saw it not in words, not in posts, not in arguments. He saw it in life, in action. Another wonderful story, St. George. St. George, you guys know, was tortured for seven years. Right? The, 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 the history books tell us over the course of his martyrdom, 40,900 pagans were converted. How they counted exactly, you know, this is always suspect to me. Whatever, right? A lot, okay? We're just going to go with a lot there. To Christianity, including the Empress of Alexandra. So how do you think they were converted? He, he was tortured publicly, and obviously the emperor was trying to get him to break. What do you think he said when he's being tortured? Do you think he said, you pieces of garbage, God's going to burn you in hell, I'll see you all? And, and Is that what you think? Do you think 40,000 or a lot of people would be converted if they heard someone just spewing venom as he went down and got tortured and spew hatred and anger? He spewed love over and over and over again. 
right? I remember a sermon Abuna Carlos gave eight years ago on Good Friday when he said when they put a, a sword in Christ's side, they pierced him with a sword, out came love. Even when he got pierced, love came out, right? This is what converted 40,900 people. It wasn't anger and hatred and resentment and let's get them. And what we see today in the West is not that, right? This is unfortunately how many American Christians handle this issue. And I, I don't know why, right? Maybe they haven't seen the persecution we've seen. They don't have the experience we have. They haven't been persecuted for as long as we've been persecuted, right? The Christian church has been persecuted from the very beginning. It started with Jesus, <laughs> And then the Romans, and then you just go on from one group to the next, right? It didn't last long. Then the Muslims came, and then the, the, the communists come. I mean, it's just persecution after. We've always lived under persecution. This is the way Christians live, right? And in America, I guess, you know, no one's used to that here. It's more like, you know, in God we trust. This is a Christian country. We got to keep it Christian. We got to make sure it's Christian. We got to make sure the power is Christian. And that's just not orthodoxy. We kind of we thrive in the other situation. We're not used to a government that works for us. And it's not very good for a government to work for us. It always ends badly. And so the question is, can we use Satan's approach to defeat Satan? Can we use hatred and anger and venom to oppose Satan? When Satan is attacking the church, we think we'll just use his weapon against him back. Does it work? Right? And that's ultimately what we find ourselves doing. We go back and we use the same tactics Satan is using. I mean, you, you talk to people, you know, my parents' generation, and they'll tell you, you know, uh, they're so upset with the way the, the Muslims ruled Egypt, right? And they made, you know, it was, the, it was a Muslim government and all the things, right? And so then they, they really want that here. Right? And you're like, you were so upset in Egypt that the Muslims ruled and they make it a Muslim country and that they forced people to be Muslim and they forced all of this Islam on you. And now here you come to America and you're like, it's my turn. So what are you going to do when it's your turn? The exact same thing that they did. Really? You're going to just do the exact same thing? You're going to use the same tactics, the same tools? Let's, let's use the law, let's use the government to get you know, make sure everyone is Christian and make sure they act the way they should and do. And, you know, they used to make us pray five times. Well, we'll make sure Sunday all the stores are closed because that's our day of prayer. I mean, it's the same stuff. So we have to be careful. And, and this quote by St. Isaac this year, and I don't know if you can read it, it's small. It says, know that if fire comes out from, your, from you and burns others, God will ask you for the souls of the burnt. This one condemns. If fire comes out of you and burns the soul of someone else, and I'm talking about this fire of truth, the, the God fire that comes out of us, God will ask you for the souls of the burnt. It's not okay to just throw stuff at people. It's not okay to just attack them using the Bible. It's not okay to demonize them under the guise of, you know, I'm, I'm trying to speak truth to them. Right? We have to be um, wary and wise in our approach. I'll skip this. So how do we handle this? When our children come, first key, listen calmly. When they talk about anything, no matter what it is. Don't get angry. Point out the positives. Let them see it from the point a view of a loving God. So sometimes when, when our kids say, you know, in school today, the teacher said that, you know, cows and humans should, you know, be able, or anyone, you know, should be able to just have sex. And that's a normal, natural thing. And that's okay. We should accept those people. That's just bestiality. And that's their choice. That's what the teacher said. Is that right, dad? And you're just like, okay. And that reaction is key. Because if I see the, 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 the demon, the, the, the human that is trying to change my kid and teach my kid something, then my reaction will be that. But if I see a demon manipulating someone or someone speaking out of some curriculum that was, you know, put together by whatever, 
then my reaction is different. There's a, there's a, 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 a sadness that falls upon me of the state of the world and of the deception. And the reason I say this is that reaction is everything because the kid's looking right in your eyes. You can't hide it. You can't hide it, right? And, and ask any of your kids the truth about you and you'll say, you think, oh yeah, well my kids don't know how I feel about that. Ask them, watch. They'll say, oh yeah, my, my dad hates that. You know, I'm shocked the stuff my kids say about me. None of it's true. Um, there's a story about St. Silouan uh, and, and his, and so St. Silouan was um, one of like nine kids. They're all tasked to cook dinner. Um, and uh, I, I know I told this story before, sorry. Um, they were all tasked to cook dinner. And one time, St. Silouan, is a Wednesday, it was, his it was his turn to make dinner. He forgot it was Wednesday, he forgot it was fasting, so he made a meat dinner. He made a non-fasting dinner. His dad comes home from the field, very tired. He sits down, he sees the food's not fasting. What does he do? Nothing. He just eats quietly. They go, and then six months later, six months later, his dad comes up to him and goes, do you remember, and St. Swan writes about this in his memoirs, do you remember the dinner you made on that Wednesday six months ago, and it was, it was a fasting day, but you forgot and you made not? You should remember that it's a fasting day. He waited six months. Now, if we can wait six seconds, that's, you know, that's an achievement. But he, he remembered it so much, right? He remembered that his dad had that kind of patience, and he waited till the emotion was gone, till the moment was gone, till he was totally calm. He had processed, why am I upset that my son didn't make fasting food? Is it because I failed as a parent? I didn't raise him properly. He needs to learn. He processed. He thought about it, right? We have to have that same kind of reaction. Okay, it's very hard to do, right? But it's key. St. John Chrysostom says, no matter how just your words may be, you ruin everything when you speak with anger. No matter how just your words may be, you ruin everything when you speak with anger. I've never done this, but Lois, you know, she's the one. <laughs> and so we have to, <laughs> you know, as, as I, I look around the room, when I said that quote, lots of Couples looked at each other. All right. Um, I'm not going to look up again because you're all going to look. Through. Okay. So we, we have to remove the distortions of who is God, right? They see in us God, right? Like it or not. You are the image and likeness of God, right? You're the moon that reflects the sun, to, especially to a kid, right? And if they see their God pissed off, yelling, what's wrong with all these stupid people? These guys are idiots. They're ruining our country. God's going to send these all, all these people to hell. That's the image of God. And at some point, they're going to wake up and go, you know, that image, that, that God sucks. That God isn't loving. That God gets very angry and very insulting towards others. God does not hate them. Don't ever say that. God does not accept their sin or mine. Okay. Have, you seen, have your kids seen you go crazy and hateful on these people their whole life? Do you think they'll come to you if they have an issue or want to talk? If every time someone, same sex, that topic comes up and you just went off the rails, what happens when in eighth grade and they're going through puberty and they have a weird time in their life? You think they're going to talk to you? What are you, nuts? Right? If all they've seen is you lose your temper, I can't tell you how many kids I'm like, well, have you talked to your parents? What? They, just, they just say to me, what are you, crazy? That's the response. What are you, crazy? You think I'm going to tell my mom about this? You think I'm going to tell my dad about it? He's nuts. All right, so who are they talking to? They're talking to other eighth graders. They're talking to high schoolers. They're talking to YouTube, TikTok. That's who they're talking to. You have to be the calm person who no matter what happens, you just listen and you take it. And they know they can come to you and you're not going to lose your mind on them. Um, we are not endorsing the action, but there's no need to keep pointing that out. Once your kids know your position, you don't have to keep saying it. Once they know your position, I mean, you know, maybe it'll take three or four times, but not three or four hundred. Every time a gay person comes on the TV, and they do a lot now, you don't have to say it every time. Look at those guys. Look at them. They're just taking over the whole... You said it. They've heard it. 
maybe it takes a couple of times. You don't have to say it every time. Once the, your position is known, you keep saying it your nag. Right? Let your action become the position. Don't just keep talking. And then the final, how do we handle it? You don't have to have the talk about the gaze, like in some full-blown matter, like the, the talk we have about you know, um, you know, reproduction and sex and all the things that we do with the kids, right? We can do it in little pieces, okay? And this is you know, great advice is that when your child, and some of you have young kids, ask the, a small question, you give a small answer very calmly. You know, if they say, hey, where do babies come from? I'm like, oh, God, all right, let's, all right, I guess we're going to do this. Okay. Oops, sorry, I don't know what just happened. Um, then the kid's not going to talk to you. I'm just going to mute it because it's keep making sounds. Okay. Um, you know, don't do that, right? Just very calmly say a biological answer, right? A scientific answer. Use scientific words and just say a few things. Kids are going to ask you about the gay kid at school, the gay parents, the two moms, the two dads, calmly just respond. And we'll get to some of the responses that I'm not going to tell you about here in a second. Gently, calmly, slowly, patiently, like God is with us. And I, I like this quote, just as God is patient with you and puts up with you, so you must be patient with your children. You have a duty to advise them, not with friction and anger, but calmly and peacefully. If they don't listen, the responsibility's all theirs. This is huge. I don't know who started this whole thing about, you know, the, these kids are my responsibility and God is going to judge me for how I raise them. You know, at a certain age, it, it's, it's, they have a free will, don't they? You had a free will. You were a teenager once, right? What did you do? Everything. And who did it? Was it your parents? Your parents didn't even know about it. Right? So, you know, the problem with, with that very strong stance is it, 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 it creates a fear in us. Like, I have to control this. I have to stop this behavior. Right? And you make a fist when you, when you say it. Right? I mean, you can just look at the kid and go, all right, is that what you want to do? And, there, and we have to do this as parents. Right? There is a time when there's six and you say, you know, you can't drink, you know, a, a bottle of soda, okay? But when they're 18 and they want to drink a soda, you're like, well, you know it's full of chemicals. You know it's going to give you cancer. You know it's bad for you. You know it's hard. But if you want to drink it, I don't know, drink it. I mean, I've already taught you. I can't, I can't not make you drink for the rest of your life. And that, that letting go is hard. In Christian life, it's, it's the same, right? I mean, at some point, you have to say, you know, they're going to say, I don't want to go to church. I mean, they're 11. Yeah, you're going. You know, not good luck with that, right? But when they're 18, 19, it's your call, man. You know, I'm going. You know how we raised you. You know, if you're going to try to force them, at that point, you're going to turn the screws. Guess what you just did? It's not going to go well. God is patient with you. You must be the same with your children. You have a duty to advise them, not with friction and anger, but calmly, peacefully. If they don't listen, their responsibility is all theirs. You must then entreat God to illumine them and guide them in the path of his commandments, right? The old cliche, when they're young, you talk to them about God. When they're older, you talk to God about them, right? And, and this topic has a bit of that as well. So how do we handle this with other people's kids? This is a big one. And this is something parents need to hear. That's the story of the prodigal son coming back to his dad. Prodigal sons come back. Sons come back. People come back. This church is full of that. People come back. But who are we in this story? I talked about this last time. Imagine if the older brother had come out to greet the prodigal son. We are the older brother. When, one of, when, when any kid comes back and we know their past, we know they've messed up, we heard you know, through the grapevine, oh, did you know he's gay? And then they come back and you just kind of, right? All the things that happen in some of the, our mother churches, the things that, you know, when I um, hear about them from youth, 
first make me enraged and then make me very sad that someone could treat someone like that. But the looks and the comments, right? We're that older brother who has to be there with the dad, right? So the fact that the older brother wasn't there with the dad means what? He's not the image and likeness of his dad because his dad ran out to greet the younger brother. And the fact that the older brother didn't means he's not in his image and his, it's not his son. And if imagine if the older brother had been praying for his return of the younger brother, right? So as a community, we are going to face this issue, right? It's going to happen if it has already. And how we as a community respond to these people is very important, right? That's what they feel. And I'll tell you what, the numbers are, are skewed in our favor. You can have a young person come back and say, everyone in that church thinks I'm a piece of garbage. But there's this one guy, every time he sees me, he hugs me, and he says, I missed you. I go for him. And that's a great, that's a great statistic. Everyone in that church thinks I'm a piece of garbage, but uncle such and such, or tons of such and such, they throw their arms around me, and I want to go and see them because I want them to hug me and look at me not like a piece of garbage, right? So we have to be that loving person, right? When the kids come back or when the kids are gone, we throw our arms around them, right? And we're there with the dead. St. Isaac says, be gentle rather than zealous. Lay hold of goodness rather than justice. Zealous and justice are dangerous components. Those are the guys holding signs in the very beginning. Zealous and just. And if you have to pick, St. Isaac the Syrian says, gentle and good. Gentle and good. The words that were spoken about Christ in Matthew 10 was that a, a smoldering wick he would not quench. Right? You have a, a, a candle that's about to, to burn out right? And it's very fragile, and he doesn't quench it. The people who are in this state, the people who are sinners, all of us are fragile, right? One look, one word, one comment, fragile, right? Focus on the goodness, focus on the, the justice, uh, on the, sorry, on the, the gentleness, sorry. Um, so just a, a small uh, thing of history. Um, this is, uh, so when, when, when the church was in uh, the age of martyrdom, right, a bunch of people, as you can imagine, when pressed, decided, yeah, I'm not going to say I'm Christian, right? You know, some guy's got a sword to my throat, some soldier, and says, hey, you Christian? And if you say yes, he just pushes forward and he punctures your throat, and that's the end of you, right? So very, quite a few people said, nah, <laughs> not so much. I think the guy down the street is. <laughs> Abuna in the back is. <laughs> Get the bishop. Um, and so what happened is the Christians, right, who find out about these, like, you know, these, these guys who denied their faith got pissed off. And they, they're like, well, should we take these people back in our church? Right? Because these, during the, the age of persecution, all these people, of course, disappeared. They didn't come to the church. And then when the churches became, when after 313, Constantine declared Christianity state religion, all these people showed up. They're like, oh, now you show up right? Now the churches are full, you bunch of, you know, slackers, right? And then some people said, this guy Militius said, no, we shouldn't allow them back in the church. They denied Christ, right? He wanted to, you know, he, what did he want to do? He wanted to be zealous and just, right? But the church won that argument and said, no, we're going to accept all of them, and we're going to love them, and we're going to throw our other arms around them, even though they denied Jesus. Yeah, even though they denied Jesus, they're back here now, and we're going to accept them, right? So this is something the church has dealt with before. Okay, I'll, uh, I know I'm taking too long. Uh, for Christians, above all men, are forbidden to correct the stumblings of sinners by force. And this comes back to, you know, what's, what's happening in this country. We're trying to pass laws to try to make people act like Christians. And I wonder if that's the right thing to do. He says, it's forbidden to correct the stumbling of a sinner by force. It is necessary to make a man better, not by force, but by persuasion. We neither have authority granted us by law to restrain sinners, nor if it were, and he's talking about the, the, the law of the land, 
Should we, you, should we know how to use it since God gives the crown to those who are kept from evil, not by force, but by choice? So he's basically saying even if, you, if it worked and you got the law on your, on your own side and you made someone moral by law, are they moral? Does God work that way? Does God say, oh, well, I guess you didn't, you know, do whatever because it's illegal. You're a good person. Is that the way God works? All right. I'll skip this. Okay, so you remember this icon? This is the one I started with, them beating the guy, and we said it was Satan. This is actually the icon of the Good Samaritan. And it's Christ carrying the Good Samaritan. And in this icon, what I love about it is they depict the robbers as devils. The robbers are the devils. And then what did he do? He carried. The Lord carries us. When someone has been beaten by Satan, the real enemy... What do we do with our fellow neighbor? He carries the burdens, and, it, and, and Christ says, be imitators of me. Or St. Paul says, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. So we're called to carry these sinful people. And where do we carry them to? Where did he take them? In this other icon, you see Christ carrying the sinner, the, 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 the man who was beaten, to the church, right? So this is where people go to recover. This is what we do. We take the sinful, we carry them, and carrying is not easy. It hurts your back, and we bring them to the church where they recover and where they heal and where God, you know, the hospital. Um, I love this. This is a, there was a, 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 a gay pride parade in the Philippines, and this Christian organization uh, staged, if you will, quote unquote, a counter rally at the same time as the gay pride uh, rally. And this is the signs. I'll read them to you because I, I, you may not be able to read them from back there. It says, God loves you and so do we. Can we hug you? It says, I'm sorry. We're here to apologize for the way that we as Christians have harmed the LGBT community for hiding behind. I'm sorry for hiding behind religi religion when really I was just scared. I'm sorry I looked at you as a sex act instead of a child of God. I'm sorry I've looked down on you instead of honoring your humanity. I'm sorry I rejected and hurt your family in the name of family values. I'm sorry for judging you. I'm sorry for not listening. I love this. It's beautiful. Again, we're not condoning the acts, right? And I put this weapon up last time. You know that you have made God in your image when he hates the same people you do, right? And we see this over and over in protests and rally and attacks. Uh, these, the more signs. I used to be a Bible-banging homophobe. Sorry, Jesus didn't turn people away, neither do I. Okay. All right, so... Mm, I'll, all right, so quickly, what's our church view? God has given us the gift of matrimony. It's a sacramental union between one man and one woman. This doesn't change. Male and female were created for communion with each other. Sac sacramental marriage is the only proper context for sexual relationship. Sexual union is ordained by God and thus deemed as good. Any sexual gratification outside of sacramental marriage, pornography, adultery, fornication is not consistent, whether it be homosexual or heterosexual, with God's perfect plan for us, and therefore is not it's cut off. Um, not good, probably, or something like that. Hmm? Not blessed. There you go. <laughs> All right. Um, and so this is our stance, right? It's, it's simple. Okay? And there's no targeting of one group, and there's no picking on one sin more than another. Um, it's just kind of balanced. And, and I, I'll stop. Okay. Um, the attraction versus the act. And just very quickly, just to kind of go over, there's a difference between having same-sex attraction and, having, and engaging in same-sex acts. Lots of people have same-sex attraction. And uh, it's, it's un for some people, they go through it in puberty where, you know, you, you suddenly have these feelings and you don't know what to do with them, right? And your child may come up to you and say, you know what, I, I think I like boys, right? And again, your reaction at that moment is clutch. 
right? If all of a sudden you well up in anger and you're like, this is what the school district has done. This is what that teacher did. It's because he had that gay teacher in the fourth grade. This is, you know, the books at Walmart. It's those commercials. It's those cartoons. It's the media. It's Biden. It's name the thing, right? And, every, and, and everything wells up inside you. And what comes out is that is against God and God's going to send those people to hell and you better. And then it's not good, right? So there are two reactions to that statement and each one is an extreme, right? The first reaction is the one I just gave you, which is fire and brimstone and sulfur coming out of your mouth about these people and this agenda and, and what God's going to do to them. And there's no way you can be like this. Right? And unfortunately, the reason I think that reaction happens is because the reaction we see at school, which is, hey, you know, I had a, I, I think I like boys. I had a thought the other day. The teacher goes, great, let's start, you know, gene therapy, you know, a hormone therapy right away. We'll stop puberty and we can get a sex change done before, you know, your parents find out. Right? And that's the reaction, right? Or, or people are engaging in this, like, this is great. You're coming out. This is wonderful. You need to engage. It. And all of a sudden, this, this, you know, seventh grader who had a thought, is now being encouraged to change, right? And you know that's happening, okay? So then my reaction to counter this craziness is fire and brimstone and sulfur and anger, right? And unfortunately, what happens is the kids don't know the whole story, right? I was, I was in Seattle a few weeks ago, and this, this you know, this, um, this mom, a friend of ours, comes up, and she's hot. And... She's upset because, I don't know why it's doing this. My screen is not showing. Uh, that's good that it's showing you guys, but it's not showing me. Anyway, uh, she's upset because in her school, they're forcing all the book, uh, the, what's it called? The book reports on these, on these gay topics, right? Gay books. That's all. And on Mother's Day, they read a book about two dads, right? And she's like, at least respect the mother. Like that was the, the mandated book that they talk. And she's just pissed off, right? Like, what is this? Like, respect the mothers. Say, you know, make them draw a bunny or something, you know, like what we normally do. And then we take these things and we put them on the fridge, they're, but they're ugly. Anyway, so the, the, she was very upset and, and she was, and I, and I told her, I said, look, you have to be careful because you're going to react based on all this and your kids don't know all of that. All they see is mommy going nuts, right? And they're going to watch you just be hateful and, and, and say all these things right? And they don't know what you're reacting to. They just think you're a nut job who hates people. So you have to control that anger because they don't know what you know. They don't see what you see. They don't have that history that you have. Okay. For some reason I can't. Oh, there it is. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So let's go through some common questions. Okay. I don't know why it's doing this. All right. So these are questions that uh, people have submitted. And uh, this comes to the presentation part of our presentation. Kids asking why their friends have two moms or two dads. What do I say? One said her son's fourth grade friend now looks like a girl because they're transitioning and her son is confused. Finding books. Finding books have same, uh, same gender couples, parents, and they discovered after the child read it asks why. How much to limit exposure, restrictions, interactions, etc., but still teach love and tolerance? What if your child has a friend who's gay or know someone is gay at school? How can they show kindness and be a Christian without being influenced? Is it okay for two men or two women to get married and or have children? How do you answer that without being judgmental? And your kid asks, can I attend a gay wedding? It was a controversial topic. What's wrong with being gay? Should we be explaining LGBTQ and the pronouns and genders to our kids proactively? What do I do if I sense my child is leaning towards homosexuality? I sense my boy is effeminate and has no interest in women. You hit them. Give them trucks. Dirt. Should I keep my convictions against the act of homosexuality to myself? Or is it, it is so widely prevalent and acceptable now that I can very well be ostracized for expressing my true feelings. So these are all really good questions. Okay. Um, and there are no easy answers to these questions and many more. <laughs> George is looking at me like, really, this is what we paid for. Um, the, the <laughs> so 
Lots of questions back. How old is the person asking these questions? Are they six or are they 16? How old are you? What is your relationship? Is it your kid? Is it your Sunday school teacher? Or even if it's a friend, is it a close friend or a not so close friend? Is it someone you've talked to, someone you've shared with? How close is your relationship? Where is this contact? Is it at school? Is it at work? Is it at the gym? Is it at some social thing? Is it in the Cub Scouts? And there's just parts of this that are unfortunate. Truth makes some people angry. Abuna Carlos mentioned this last week. You hear it, some people hear it, and they just get mad. They don't want you to preach to them, right? And so even if they come point blank and say, what do you think about this topic? That's a loaded question, right? And your answer could get you fired, could get you ostracized, could get you labeled as a bigot. And then some people just aren't seeking truth yet. And so we have to be wise and discerning in that, right? A lot of times people say, well, I'm just dropping seeds, I'm just dropping seeds. You have to be careful, right? You just don't throw seeds at everyone's face, right? Some people, when they're ready, they'll come and some people, if you say something, you're just going to turn them so quickly. It takes discernment. No one is listening anymore. People are just speaking over each other. This is, the, this is the state of the world, right? This is the state of the debate on any topic, including wearing a mask, right? So it doesn't matter. We don't know how to have discussions anymore. We don't know how to have debates anymore. We don't know how to have thoughtful, provoking conversation without getting pissed off and putting someone else in a box. And the thing is, there's counter arguments to everything, right? You start to say something like, oh yeah, I know what you're gonna say. You're gonna say that blah, 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 God made Adam and Eve, but you know what? And, and so the person asking you the question isn't really asking anything, right? They're just waiting for you to speak and they're really waiting for you to stop speaking so they can tell you the counterpoint that they already heard. Right? And, and this happens both, both ways. Right? So all of this complicates the answers. Right? All of these variables move and they change. And so what I'm going to say to one person, I'm not going to say to the person sitting next to them. It's just too hard. And to give a canned answer and say, say this in this situation, that's probably not going to be effective. All right, so instead I'm going to give you an unfulfilling answer. This is from Elder Proforius. He says, what saves and makes for good children is the life of the parents in the home. I'm just watching George and Julie, if only I could hear what they're saying. The parents need to devote themselves to the love of God. They need to become saints in their relation to their children through their mildness, patience, and love. They need to make a new start every day with a fresh outlook, renewed enthusiasm, and love for their children. And the joy that will come to them, the holiness that will visit them, will shower grace on their children. Generally, and this sucks, the parents are to blame for the bad behavior of the children. <laughs> Sorry, Peter, I didn't mean to look at you. And they're <laughs> I know it's not Sherry, all right? And their behavior. <laughs> and their behavior is not improved by reprimands disciplining, or strictness. If the parents do not pursue a life of holiness and if they don't engage in spiritual struggle themselves, they make great mistakes and transmit the faults they have within them. The solution is to be found through the sanctification of the parents. Become saints and you will have no problems with your children. The sanctity of their parents releases the children from their problems. Okay, so what's the answer? There's no answers, right? The answer is B right? Because the kid will feel and absorb it. You're like, how do I give them the right answer? Be the right answer. And that starts with ourselves, our own education, our own bigotry, our own ignorance, our own hatred, our own judgment. That's, what we, that's where the battle is. It isn't, what do I got to say? All right? Because you can say whatever you want to say. Kid's going to see right through you, right? Just like, you know, when we were growing up, you remember the fake uncle and the fake tante at church who was a hypocrite? Do you remember who I'm talking about? Yeah, we all remember them, right? Oh, Habibi, blah, blah, blah. And you look at her, she hates my guts. And you just know, right? They can say whatever they want, right? It's kind of like this, you know, I, I love the sinner, but I hate the sin. 
And it's like, I can look in your eyes for two seconds and I can tell you, you don't love me. Don't say that. Stop lying to me. Right? So don't add lying on top of not loving. This quote, I use it on almost every talk now. There would be no need for sermons, usually when I'm giving a sermon, if our lives were shining. There would be no need for words if we bore witness with our deeds. There would be no more pagans if we were true Christians. So this is really the solution. We work on the inside. But having said that, I do want to say there are important conversations to have with your children. And you need to have them. And you need to, I, I want to encourage you to talk with them calmly, patiently, lovingly, proactively, in the most Christian spirit you can muster. Right? And focus on seeing everyone as the image of God. Focus on seeing the enemy as Satan. Focus on my own love and, and, and tolerance for people. And that guides your answers. That the kid feels it. Right? When, when, when I look at, it, at someone living a lifestyle I don't agree with, whether that be a gambling addiction, a, a homosexual lifestyle, a porn addiction, a whatever, a liar, a judger, a, whatever, right? And, and my first reaction is, you know, that person does. Wrong reaction, right? That's a judgmental reaction, right? If my reaction is, they're broken and I'm broken, simple. All right, did you hear, you know, did you hear what he did? Who cares? Did you hear what I did? You just don't know. You just don't know. So I'm not going to judge anybody. End of discussion. That spirit gets transmitted to our kids. Right? They feel that. And then you can have that same conversation with your child at 5 and at 7 and at 9 and 11. And each one of those answers is different. For the same question that they're going to ask at each of those ages, there's a different answer. And you'll have it. It'll just come. And I think that's really the only way to approach something so complex, in my opinion. All right, so I'll stop here and uh, see if anyone has any questions. <laughs> Or anything to add or say or thoughts or feelings or stuff. Hmm? Everyone's quiet. Yes. Yeah, I, I see what you're saying. I mean, um, what, I guess what I was referring to is the condemnation, uh, a, a recurring condemnation or a recurring, you know, giving my perspective. But yeah, every moment's a teachable moment, right? Especially if the context is different, right? Slightly different, which it always is. You know, like, oh, you, you know, he could have handled that differently. I mean, even when you're watching a cartoon and a, and a child gets mad in the cartoon, you can say, oh, what else? How else could he have handled that, right? And they're always teachable moments. I agree. Hundred percent. Yeah. Any other thoughts? You guys are a vocal group. I've been watching whispering this whole time. On the realm of the church and talked about different topics but among them this this came up and so you know one thing that I, I really took away from what he was saying is that Philip Mamlakis he's uh, in the Eastern Orthodox Church um, he's a PhD psych psychologist um, has seven kids don't know why but he does uh, I don't I know we're no, I'm, <laughs> Factories closed, <laughs> but the uh, um, so anyways, uh, one of the points he, he made was that 
we these teachable moments that that Jeannie was bringing up is is that we don't we shouldn't wait to teach our kids about what God has ordained, right? So it's it's not like our response to what marriage is should not be in response to seeing a same-sex marriage or a same-sex couple. Our response should be to teach our kids what God has ordained as marriage, what God has ordained as a loving relationship, what God has ordained as a healthy sexual relationship, right? And each and like what Mark was saying is like there's it's age appropriate for for different levels, right? So I'm not going to talk to my six-year-old about, you know, what a healthy sexual relationship is, but I will talk to her about that, you know, God made a husband and a wife able to have children, and that's the way that God wants to see us have children, right? And so we, we talk to them kind of stepwise through their years and kind of teach them what God has ordained for us spiritually, biblically, um, in our faith, um, and then also, you know, they when they ask questions about, you know, the the same sex couple that is that are the parents of their in their soccer team, that's an opportunity for us to talk about what God has ordained as for marriage in our church, right? That God that that we believe that God has made, you know, man and woman to be married and so forth. But then also to to be, make it very clear that we don't hate or we don't dislike the family we don't dislike the the child in particular because the child has nothing absolutely nothing to do with it right um, we teach them to be kind and loving to those children to the parents to treat the parents respectfully um, and um, so I thought those were really nice points that that he pointed out to us in, in those talks and we've tried to use them and I think it's been somewhat successful with the little bits and pieces where we've had to be able to use those. But. Um, I know this is uh, primarily on um, people who are gay, or, um, but I was also I was watching a Disney show with Sophia, and we noticed that there was a kid in the Disney show who um, grew up and decided that he wanted to be a girl. And she, she looked at me and she said, Mommy, that's a girl. And I said, No, sweetheart, that's a boy. And he decided that he wanted to be a girl, but God made him a boy. And God doesn't make dis mistakes. And so I didn't know. I was like, I don't know what to say to my 11-year-old about, you know, this kid who is basically transgender, you know, transitioning to be a girl. And I was like, this happens every day in high school. You know, I watch it happen with these kids every day. And, and I just, I, I needed to tell her he was created this way by God. And God doesn't make dis mistakes. There are people who are um, who feel a certain way. There are people who are born without arms and born without legs and born with different diseases and born with this. But God doesn't make mistakes, and there's a reason for the way that they're created, and and we just have to trust that that's the way they are, um, and God has a purpose for them. And I don't know if that was right, but I was like, it's all of it is happening every day when they're watching Disney, when they're watching like when they're watching anything and so I feel like we really have to be on our you know toes when when it happens but but I told her like you still got to love them like you can't be mean to them you, you got to be kind to them and you got to make sure that you're loving on them because they're God's creation like I don't know it's a crazy world <laughs> So there was a question up there that you had, and Mira and I actually encountered one of those questions where I had a family member who was about to get married, and Mira and I were like, what do we do? Do we say yes? Do we say no? And that was so, and we, we asked, so it was like, okay, we'll ask these abunas, and we'll see the best out of whatever, and see which one comes up, you know, and we'll go from there. You're not, you're not supposed to admit that, Dennis. Well. <laughs> I asked 11 abunas do. waiting for the one that agrees with me. I think well, is the well is the best best out of five I guess and best abunas and, and best is defined as so do we go to a wedding my 
a gay wedding. Uh, I did have a family member who was about to get married. Um, and Mira and I were like, what do we do? <laughs> you could break the tie. They're out. Let me, let me go to this. There we go. Uh, Dennis, yeah, I don't know. I think, um, and Mark and I have talked about this, Marty and I have talked about this before too, and I actually got this question uh, at Cal State Long Beach, um, and this was like two years ago, and I was giving a talk about something like this, and I was like, yeah, there you go, and then afterwards I'm like, yeah, I shouldn't have said that, because um, it really does depend on the situation. Um, but I think talking to the Abunas was the right thing to do. I don't know about talking to five Abunas, and I don't know if you were looking for three out of five or what, what your cutoff was going to your threshold there, but <laughs> I know you do have to ask an odd number though, because then you can, you know, you'll have an answer one way or the other, but, um, so that was a good strategy. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I didn't take the mic for that reason. I, I, there was something that struck me and something that struck me about what Mariana said and something that struck me on one of your slides too, Marty, about, um, you know, what we do believe. And I, increasingly, when, and I talk to a lot of youth about this too, um, increasingly it's about, you know, what's a sin? Is this a sin? That's the question, right? Is this, just, just tell me. Like, if it's, it's a sin, I'm going to put it in that column, and then I won't, you know, I'll know what to do. And um, I think we really focus on that a lot, and I don't think that's the right way to think about this um, as, you know, let's put this in. Is it a sin, this, this, these two moms? right, of my kids' soccer, whatever, on my kids' soccer team, are they sinning? And we want the answer to that. And I, I'm increasingly, um, I just don't think that's the right way to think about this. I liked on the slide, you know, this idea of this is what we believe. This is what God's plan was. Um, and all th sorts of things. He doesn't make mistakes, but I mean, cancer is natural and diseases are natural. And someone born with one arm is natural. And is that a mistake? I mean, no. But maybe God made that boy to have a, you know, a transgender disease, whatever. Like maybe his, I mean, his brain is wired such that he wants to be a girl now. I mean, and I don't know. There's a lot that goes into that. But um, so I think thinking about what God does ideally want for us is important um, instead of how all the, all the ways we've messed it up, which we have. Um, and then I think it's also important for us to think about same-sex attraction in the context of any sexual, any sex outside of marriage, right? It's just, that's, we're not up in arms about, you know, adultery laws. Why aren't Christians picketing that we should make adultery illegal, right? That's very clearly not what God has ordained for us. We're focused on this particular sexual sin. Um, and I think it's easiest just to think of them all as one category of, it's one man, one woman, sex only in that context, period. That's it, in the context of marriage. Anything outside of that is just not what God had planned, um, including a heterosexual person lusting after someone who's not his wife. That's Anyway, I don't know what I'm saying, but I just had several things that uh, I wanted to react to. <laughs> I mean, it's the only thing I want to add is that we're not afraid of truth. Because if someone says, is adultery sin, I will say, yes, it's sin. Is a homosexual... Um, relationship a sin it's a sin because what happens is like if I don't answer the question then what happens is that you know as Archie was speaking about this uh, great talk about love right so if I if all I do is speak about like we need to honor respect we need to be kind and and all of these things and I never speak about truth then our children will be raised without knowing truth like what is the truth you know, because the other thing, too, is that at one point, um, at one point, they'll ask, 
Abuna, can you marry this homosexual couple? And I, I'm going to say no. So they're going to know, okay, so you consider them, you consider it a sinful uh, relationship. And it's like, yes, of course. It's a, like it's, if, if something is not permitted, then that means it's not condoned or uh, the plan, God's plan, right? So I just want to, I just want to clarify that point that we, we can't be afraid of truth. Again, like Archie said, it's, we should, we have to be careful not to constantly have conversations about, you know, this is what they're doing or that at every opportunity on the show, it's like, you know, these sinful people and, and so forth. But I, we have to answer the question of, okay, so is it a sin? The relationship is a sin. The, the person, if, if he, like you said, and I agree with you that like, Humanity is corrupt. Like there's, um, like Mary said, there's cancer. There's all of these things, and there are exceptions to everything, right? So, like, so if someone says, "Is abortion a sin?" Right? Like, if you just ask that one question, it's like, yes. But even the church has exceptions, right? But everyone wants the exception to the rule, and so forth. But if if it's just a general question, it is, you know, and even with the like, you know, I want to give a perspective on the whole wedding, the whole wedding thing. You know, as a priest, whenever we, whenever we uh, perform a marriage, before the marriage, we ask the people, uh, we ask the couple, give us, we need two witnesses. Two witnesses so that it's efficient, because we can't get the witnesses of everyone. And so that's comes a question we have to ask. Can I sign as a, am I willing to sign as a witness? to this union, right? You're saying I'm here for this union and you want me to sign my name to say that it is a valid union. And that's a question that we ask ourselves, right? Um, so I just wanna, I just wanna touch on the, on the point of like that truth. We, at some point we can be as gentle as possible, but there will come to the final step of can you marry them? And we will say no. And then we will have, we will have to say, say the truth. Yeah, I, I think, um, yeah, this is all really good. I don't, have it, I don't have the answers or anything. I'm not claiming that. But I think one good thing is when it's impersonal, it's, it's a lot harder. So... Um, when it's an idea, when it's a concept. So like the, the icon that you had of the, the father, the prodigal, you know, the parable of the prodigal son, we have to get our hands dirty. We have to go be with these people. We have to put a face to this. It's not an idea. It's very, very different when you see the face. And like, thank you, Abuna, because we have the Bible. We have the truth. We can't deny that. I mean... We, like, we can't go to that opposite extreme and be like, I'm afraid to express my opinion because everyone's going to think this or that about me. We have to be wise in the way we say it. There's certain times where it's a trap. Someone's basically trying to trap you. Um, but I think, like, like, I'll say just one little example. Like, in my experience, I saw some of our kids when I, was, when I worked in the jail. You know, I saw some of our kids, especially in the, um, the gay and transgender dorms. And I have to... You know, I can't say it in front of the deputy, but I have to pretend like I, I don't know that person because I'm not supposed to work in that facility with someone that I know, right? And these are kids who are, they're kids who are in our Sunday school. And, um, you know, they're mostly HIV positive because they were substance abusing. And you see those kids and you're like, I know that kid. I, it's not an abstract person anymore. Um, and and it's, it's, I mean, it's just, it's just different. We have, to, we have to be the love. We have to go out there and do that. And it doesn't mean that we're condoning or we're, or we're this and that. Um, and, and like, I'm going to say one, one thing. Like, we presented at an academic conference and we're saying, okay, here's the percentage of the transgender individuals in the LA County Jail. It's about like 50 or 60 at any given time. And we presented, we're like, it's 25 to 50% of them are HIV positive. And they'll tell you. They'll tell you when you're talking to them, they're like, 
it wasn't that I shouldn't have used the condom. They're saying like, what would you tell someone? They're like, I shouldn't have gone to that apartment in the first place. I shouldn't have gone to that person. It's, it's what Abuna tells us, like what we hear in church about like flee from sin. They're basically telling you that. I mean, they have a lot of experience and they're saying I was on meth, which is like 50% of new HIV cases. I was high, I was on alcohol, I was whatever. I wasn't making good decision. And I would go and tell myself, hey, that's stupid. Don't do that. Um, so there's wisdom to gain from them. They're not like monolithic sinners that are just, you know, whatever. Um, and when, when, when you experience them and when you, when you talk to them and when you get to know them and you find 90% of those individuals, I'm not talking in general, I'm talking about the transgender, transgenders who are in the jail. It's a very unique population, right? They're in jail because they committed crimes, all of them related to substance abuse. 90% of them had their first, we don't have any kids, right? 90% of them had their first experience before age 12. And some of them, and then this academic crowd, they were like silence, stunned silence. They were like, thank you for telling us that. We had no idea. They, like they didn't know that there's developmental things that happen, that there's, it's not like, there's, it's complicated. There's tendencies, there's, maybe there's genetics. I don't know, you know, I don't have the answers. Um, but there's, there's a lot of things that go into play and we have to be sensitive to that. We have to be understanding. We have to realize that the church is the hospital for the sick. And that includes me, like, like everyone was saying. You know, it's not, oh, that's the sin. Well, yeah, I got 10 sins that are probably worse than that in God's eyes for all I know. I don't know, right? Um, so, so, I mean, I, I'm talking all over the place too, you know? But, but it's just a lot of things that you see and you feel... And it's a very different opinion that you have when we're going in and being like, you know, the father. When we're going and remembering that, whether it's masks or COVID or, you know, or homosexuality or transgender. And that person, that person when they're here, if it's the, if it's the gay or transgender kid or it's the person who's got the hair. How many times did we have a tunt or uncle who someone said, I never came to church because when I was 13, so-and-so said one thing to me and they're like 35 and and they don't come to church anymore i mean we can use it for so many different things but thank you because this is such a more positive way of looking at it and for us to take a lesson because in the end like that's what we're supposed to do right i mean be doers of the law not just hearers we're supposed to take this and do this and so yeah i just advise people back to one of my original points i don't know what it was but um, you know, just remember that like they're, they're out there and we can be accepting and, and we can be, you know, like the father. And it's, that's, to me, that's like the heart of everything we talked about today. I have a general question just, um, cause I know this has come up, you know, in, in our community and so forth. What, so let's say you know somebody who is <clears throat> dealing with these issues, right? And ultimately, you know, one thing I, I really love about this church is that a lo the majority of us, the clergy and the parishioners, really uh, care about each other's spiritual lives. And so, so what do you do with a young individual who's struggling with these issues besides, you know, on a less generic level, showing them love and praying for them, what are the steps or what are the things we as their brothers or sisters or, you know, or our priests or our clergy, what, what do we do to assist people who are struggling with these issues? What are the practical things that we do you know, and, and this is not presumably, this is somebody I know from across the church, I'm not gonna go approach him, somebody that you're close to, somebody that you have a relationship with. You know, what do we do as somebody who loves them and cares about them to, to assist these folks with their struggles? I'll tell you a story uh, that I heard just a week ago. Um, there's a priest who has, um, uh, one of the kids that confesses to him said, I think I have, you know, same-sex attraction. And he didn't, and, and so the answer to your question is it depends on the relationship. 
course, right? Um, and he, you know, was one of the kids at his church, didn't know the church kid that well, kid maybe like 14, 15. And so Abuna decided, uh, him and a, a couple other decided that after Vespers, every Saturday night, they're going to go to his house and play Uno. And they've been doing this for months. And you know, I'm like, well, what, what did you say? I haven't said anything yet. We're just going to play Uno. Right? And so what, what he's doing and the way he's doing it is he's developing the relationship first. And I think that's the key, right? Um, you know, when, when you read the story of the, 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 the sinful woman who's caught in adultery, right? Um, you know, the way that that story unfolds is Christ saves her life, right? And then he doesn't judge her and he doesn't condemn her. And he makes all the bad people who are going to throw rocks at her go away. And he treats her with respect and dignity, right? At this point, this woman is looking up at, at Jesus thinking, I would do anything for this guy, right? At this point, she's a Christian. She's a follower of that guy. Whatever that guy is, I want what he's having. And that way, and then when he's developed that relationship with her, then he goes and he says what Abuna says, go and sin no more. And he doesn't shy away from the truth, right? So, you know, this is, this is speak truth and love, right? But I think the, the key, what we're missing, and, and it isn't about, I don't think any of us really disagree on what's right or wrong, right? You know, and, and I like the way you said it, be positive. This is God's plan and this isn't simple, right? I think what, what's happening isn't the disagreement on, on that, it's the approach. We're losing kids on the approach, which is a sucky part of this, right? It's not on the dogma or on, on what's right. So the approach that we often take is let's start with truth. Let's start with, let me tell you what's right or wrong. Let me tell you, let me start with go and sin no more, right? And so if you don't have that relationship, then you, you, you don't say a word, right? You, you just, you really just kind of can't. Now, if you want, you can say, hey, let's go get coffee. Let's go play Uno. What do you like to do? You want to go for a hike? You want to develop that relationship? Feel free. And then within that relationship, right, once, once I've brought love to that person, then I can work there, right? I mean, you see this even in the monastic tradition, right? The monks, you know, the, 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 the monastery of St. Pachomius in particular, right? The whole monastery is devoted to feeding people, right? He had like 4,000 monks at one point. All they did was feed people, feed the homeless, feed the people who were poor. They were offering love, right? And then when someone came in, oh, by the way, I need to, they're, they're coming to someone who they know has their back, right? So I would say relationship, 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 right? Um, start there and there. And if it turns, you, you know, what you'll find is once, you, look, they, they know you, you go to the church, right? They know who you are, okay? Do you really need to even say a word, right? I mean, the, the, there's a wisdom, right? And you develop that relationship, and then eventually they're just going to look at you and go, hey, you know, so what do you think of? That just comes out, right? And you, you watch it happen, right? You just, you go, you hang out with someone, you do stuff with them, you just, you, you continue that relationship. And then all of a sudden someone goes, hey, you know, I had a problem. And where'd that come from? I never, right? And so they will, they will bring it up and they will talk to you, right? At, at the right time. If you, you know, you start with, well, I'm, I'm going to go speak truth to them right now. You know, that, I mean, you know, how many times have, have people tried to, hey, you know, Jesus saves and be like, are you preaching to me? You think you're better than me? Why don't you, you know, go take a flying leap, right? And that doesn't go well, right? Because it's, they're not ready for it with you at that time. Just to also add is that the church also needs, is, is in, I, th I think has, a pri has this as a priority for also the church to have a way of approaching this, right? Because there has to be a pastoral approach in the sense of like, you know, of course they need, they need a lot of prayers because, you know, to ask, to ask, um, someone who is struggling with, um, with homosexuality, there's no alternative other than essentially that they live a celibate life. 
possibly if if they're not able to um you know to to eventually have a heterosexual ma- uh, relationship right that's a very difficult thing to ask someone to basically say you might have to live a celibate life the, re- the rest of your life how do we approach it we have a lot a long way to go to address it because we can't just say god be with you you know like we have to be able to have something um and I think that that's uh, something that I, I, I know even, say, Ambassadorpion has, has that as a, as a priority, that we have to address it. So they do need a lot, also a lot of prayers, a lot of prayers, because, you know, imagine, you know, you know I, I possibly I, I can't be in a, in, a, in a relationship the rest of my life. That's a very steep thing, you know. So we also have to, on the, on the church's end, establish a particular understanding you know and you know maybe it's uh, we're, we're a little bit reactionary in that sense but part of it is part of it too is that we're trying to, the church needs to understand more in depth about about the struggle how it develops and stuff like that right i mean i'm, I'm not going to pretend to 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 know why someone struggles with homosexuality i mean yes maybe some say like the, the father figure is extremely important to the development and so forth, but it could be so many other things. We have to understand those elements and also be able to address them from that perspective, right? Maybe we need to have more, maybe we need to have more workshops and stuff about fatherhood, how to be, how to be a, a father, um, you know, how to be loving to our kids, how to, you know, deal with them and speak with them, how to discipline them, you know? Um, how to discern which kids I, you know, which kids of mine I treat in one way versus the other, according to the way that they receive things, right? Like if I if I were to spank my son, he he probably won't care. If I yell at him, all of a sudden that matters, right? And so maybe that's an element. Maybe another element. I don't know, you know. But I th- I think that that's also something that maybe us as individuals, as we start to learn more and have more of these discussions, then we can start to answer even some of the questions that Archie, you had on, on that list. Maybe there are, there are some answers, even more specific answers to some of those questions if we you know, dive into it a little bit more, right? So that also when we, when we do meet with them and approach them, you know, we can, we know, we know what, how to lead the conversation because if, if and when it comes up, you know, we don't sound like, you know why you're dealing with this and, and whatnot. Can the runner ask a quick question? Um, what do you do if you know some, somebody who's very active in the community because they have a family member or a child that's been sort of treated really badly for, you know, for their sexuality or for transgendered and they ask for your support either show up to a let's say a rally or sign on on a sign off on a letter you know to the to the school district or something how do you how should we be dealing with that i mean it's that's challenging right i mean again you, you want to support the person but not necessarily uh condone the, the activity again it depends on your relationship right if they know you they know you're at the church they know your stance and i think that's key is that they know your stance um y- you know then then i think people appreciate being supported right if you, if you had to err on a side as long as they know how you feel i think they would appreciate that right um, and, and, um, y- you know, like, you know, I mean, sometimes, uh, a, a young person will come up to me and tell me something horrendously bad. Right. And, and they know, I don't think that's the right thing. Okay. But they told me and, and I just listened, you know, and I don't need to say you really shouldn't, you know stab someone in the throat, right? I mean, that's not, but 
I just listened and, you know, what, what made you do that? And, and, and I, anyway, and then they say, you know, hey, thanks for not judging me. And that's a very different comment than thanks for saying that stabbing someone in the throat is the right thing to do, right? They know I didn't say that, but I didn't have to say that, right? So me saying it is, is uh, you know, sometimes we want to jump to that. Well, you know, I, you know I'm going to sign this, but you know that I don't think, I don't agree with this type, you know, like there's, there's a wisdom, and again, it depends on the relationship, but if they know you and they know you're in the church and they know what, you, how, how you're, what your stance is, it may mean that much more to them that you're like, wow, a guy from the church signed this, you know, and they know you don't think it's right, but you still just support it. I mean, it's a signature on a stupid thing, right? Whatever. Um, so, I, I mean, again, depends on a million things, but. I never remember who, who these stories are about. Who was the monk who, like, came upon his cell and there were robbers? St. Macarius. St. Macarius, yeah. He came upon his cell and they were robbing him. And, uh, right? And then he, like, went in, he ran in, and he, like, grabbed whatever was left and went and gave it to them. <laughs> it's like, you forgot this. <laughs> Um, so, and I think that's, I mean, I know it's a different situation, but, you know, the idea is, again, you know, is he condoning robbery? Like, did he just go to the person and say, yep, this is the right thing for you to be doing. Let me help you, you know, clearly no, right? So, but that's exactly what he's just showing them love in the face of they know perfectly well this is wrong. I mean, how many people when they ask you, hey, is this wrong? Is this a sin? Really don't know. They know. They know what you're going to, they know what the, the answer is. You can throw, you can show them the Bible verses, you can do the thing, but they know. Um, so what are they asking for, actually? And I think that's, I think that's what you're talking about. Support, love, not to be judgmental. I'm, t I'm, I have a relationship with someone now, and she's, uh, she left the church, and, um, you know, she's like an atheist now. Um, it's a bigger problem. <laughs> and, but, so, Someone was like, hey, can you talk to this girl? Okay. I guess I'm the prodigal. <laughs> I'm the prodigal son who's still out there. But um, so I've been talking to her, and at, for, I had a conversation with her, I was like, so what's your deal? And instead of just saying, hey, you know, you really should come back to the church, it's just not. She's like, look, I've talked to everybody. I know exactly that. She's very smart. She's not going to hear it. So we watch TV together now. Like, that's just what we do. And regularly and we talk every day and we text every day and i'm just her guy now and so i don't know maybe eventually we'll talk about something about the faith maybe we won't i don't know sometimes the subject kind of comes up but i'm just there to be her someone who loves her and she's one of the first comments things she said to me is thank you for not judging me um that that's my role here i'm not gonna bring her back to the church that's the holy spirit I'm just the guy who watches Avatar with her. I'm not a guy. <laughs> Peter thought it was important for me to say that. What's your pronoun? <laughs> Any other questions I won't answer? Thank you. Glory be to God forever. Amen. Abuna, can you pray for us, please?